Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. Uh, all good things have to come to an end, and the uh, Eurovision of GovTech is no exception. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. Um, I'm joined today by a really wonderful guest who uh, you know, I think is exceptionally well-placed to clarify some of the really thorny and naughty problems of, uh, of, of what Web3, uh, blockchain, DLT, all these themes sort of practically mean for the public bodies many of us work with uh, or work in. Mm. Uh, and that's Joao Rodriguez Frade from the European Commission, uh, who works for the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, a really incredibly exciting project to uh, practically apply so many of the sort of theoretical abstract concepts and, and the promise of blockchain um, that we've been hearing about for the better part of half a decade. Um, let's jump right in. Uh, and maybe to contextualize the topic more broadly, uh, some accounts of the history of the web split it into approximately three eras. Web one was the era of reading, where uh, citizens would access information about, say, uh, what their local council was saying in meetings by going online, or uh, being able to download some kind of application from the internet. The second era was the right era, where individuals could actively contribute content to platforms. Uh, that was an era which saw the rise of platforms like Facebook, where people, of course, contributed um, social media content, uh, or the sharing economy more broadly, where individuals uh, use services supplied by a wide network of intermediaries. By some accounts, we're now in Web3, uh, the own era, where individuals, citizens included, can actually uh, have a claim on owning the infrastructure and supplying the infrastructure that powers the technological systems we use on a daily basis. So the question to you, Joao, is what do you think of this chronology? Uh, does it align with your understanding of how technology has practically worked, or is there something we should be interrogating there? Okay. So before I answer the question, uh, just to clarify that when you think about the European Commission, you think about law, you think about regulation, um, and not, not doing any of that, okay? So actually, I come from uh, DG Informatics. We are Director General for Informatics, um, and we are actually the technological arm of the Commission. And what we do is a lot like what you are doing to implement tech and to make tech work. And in my case, I'm working on this European blockchain services infrastructure, which is an initiative of the European Commission and the member states to make blockchain work, primarily for the public sector, but of course, broadly speaking, for all of us, for citizens and businesses. And now coming back to the, to the question, um, is Web3 really happening and uh, will this have an impact in our lives, right? So that's, that's really the question. And what is the role of government in this transformation? Um, maybe a second note. Whatever I will say here today, it's online. So we have a website, EBSI. You can, you know, all the info is there. Um, my answer would be that nothing is linear, right? So you don't really have Web 2, Web 2, Web 3. What we see, let's say, from an European Commission perspective, when we are implementing, is that something new is indeed um, happening, something different. So historically, what we do is to interconnect governments, to interconnect systems. And we try to get the information out and in somewhere and standardize the thing so that you know, it's interoperable and it works. When it comes to Web3, and you said it all, it's about ownership. So what we are seeing is that the self-sovereign movement which was, let's say, initially started with the idea of, I want to be my own bank, right? I don't want to trust you know, the financial institutions, has now ramifications a bit everywhere. And one of the elements that is underpinning all that is also the idea of self-sovereign identity. And that is a quite important element of Web3. Because if you don't own your information, how can you be your own bank? How can you be you know, your own company? How can you be, you know, what Web3 is trying to do is to empower people to become actually a distributed set of nodes without really intermediation, right? And in the context of governments, what we see is that for the first time, we are trying to give the information to the citizens so that they control it and are able to share it in a way that the information is trusted, that there is no need for whoever is verifying the information to go back to the government and say, well, I received this. Is this really something you know, that I can trust? Or to go to some sort of intermediary that actually is asserting the you know, trustworthiness of what the citizen is providing. Of course, 
people don't see validation as, let's say, a big deal, something that happens somewhere by someone, but validation and the verification of information is really a huge thing. When you start to look at all the intermediaries, all the ways that people have to actually assert trust on information, making this now possible to happen directly between citizen and the verifier without intermediation is, is, is quite significant and will have a huge impact in the future because then you can build all the other layers of Web3 that we are seeing, including the cryptocurrency one, including the fintech one, peer-to-peer -peer loans, everything else will require that layer, the layer of trust between I am who I say I am, I come from where I say I come from, you know, I have this degree. Very interesting. So just a, a, a quick follow-up here. It sounds like what you're saying is not that we don't necessarily trust the entities that we're speaking about having to engage with, but that the process of interacting with the previous technological methods was just incredibly time inefficient, right? So it doesn't necessarily require us to challenge the faith that many of us have in the state as an institution that generally speaking is trustworthy. So the idea is the following. In Web3, the idea is don't trust verify. What we are trying to do is to make everyday documents impossible to fake, but very easy to verify. And this is where Web3 comes along because we have nowadays technologies that allow the information to become verifiable almost in instantaneously. So it means that we can turn information using new standards, these are known as the W3C verifiable credential standards, into verifiable information. And then on in addition to that, we are going to put that information on a digital wallet that everyone will have with it. I mean, with you, with me, everyone already has some of these digital wallets with information inside. So the personal data is kept in on the digital wallet. What is interesting with blockchain for us is that the trust on the issuing entity, so the government entity that issued the information, which is, let's say, a legal entity, goes on the blockchain. So when the verifier wants to know I don't know, can this university really issue this type of diploma? They can just go to the blockchain and get an accreditation that, yes, this university can issue this type of diplomas. Or, and then it can even get the public key of that entity and say, this was a diploma signed by that specific entity. So all the issuers that are involved in all the documents that we are every day, you know, getting on the web and downloading and uploading, will also have a presence. So these legal entities that don't involve so strict, let's say, requirements on privacy, will be able to prove you know, their existence through a new trust model that is blockchain-based. And that's exactly why we believe that blockchain is also quite important in this overall transformation. Sounds perfect in theory to me. Let's hear about how you're doing this in practice. So in practice, what you can uh, actually go online and see, and if you are on LinkedIn, you already saw it, probably this like logo EBSI, is that we have been working with universities across Europe, um, and we have been together with them, demonstrating what we are just talking about. So they issue a diploma, they are, let's say, having the possibility of having a decentralized identifier, which is a DID, which is another W3C specification, that DID has in it a deed document which contains the public keys. They put it on the blockchain. They start issuing diplomas onto digital wallets. The student or the future worker grow, goes abroad, shows it to a verifier, and that diploma is verified without the need of you going to LinkedIn. Is this a university that actually exists? Because uh, we are in Europe. So Europe, uh, within the Netherlands, I don't know, you might know the universities, but if you get like a university from Estonia, I'm sure you will not be like, oh yeah, this is like, the most uh, you know, obvious thing to me. So in that process, we are making this verification, as you can see from 1,000 searches without actually producing a reliable result into something that is just immediate. Sounds great. The blockchain here, why specifically is it needed for this particular approach? Would there be any other system or any other technology that could provide the same value add? Yeah, that's a good question because many people don't believe in the blockchain specifically in the public sector. Uh, I'm not saying this is like, like not breaking news. I think uh, um, because there was a huge hype, you know, blockchain could do everything from, uh, you know, your morning coffee to, you know, planes. Um, 
there was, of course, a moment where people realized that blockchain could not deliver those expectations. But we need to now understand that the blockchain still has value and still has value for the public sector. So we believe that indeed we could centralize all the information in a central database where all, let's say, the, the deed documents, as we call them, of the issuers could be retrieved or find a way to create nodes in every member state which are trustworthy and so on. Well, but if the blockchain allows us to do this in a fully trusted way, in a verifiable way, in an auditable way, why should we not create a blockchain that is actually owned by Europe, the first all European public sector driven blockchain governed by the European member states? Why not to do this and instead of creating another centralized or another intermediated system? Those are valid as well. I don't say that they aren't. What I'm trying to say is that looking at the future, I think blockchain will be used more and more given its you know, immense potential for distributed systems like this. Wonderful. Uh, I have uh, many more questions in mind, but I'm sure you do as well. So please don't hesitate to submit questions through Slido. I'll see them here and I'll do my best to ask them. But until some come in, uh, let's, yeah. let's double click a little bit on the obstacles. You mentioned one already, which is this perception of incredibly inflated expectations, which kind of aligned with the incredibly inflated price of crypto assets. And now in sort of the crypto winter that we're in, the expectations or, or the willingness of organizations to sort of invest to sort of drop, drop dramatically. Uh, what are the other sorts of obstacles that you're seeing and the practical implementation of this? And I'm really curious to hear, and maybe you have some anecdotes to illustrate this, what implementing this, working with all the m multiple member states actually looked like at a practical level? What kinds of responses yeah. did you get when you first engaged yeah. with I think in Europe, the, um, I would not like to call it obstacle, let's call it a challenge, is the fact that uh, we have a very strict, you know, personal data regulation, GDPR, which is all over Europe. And that means that the blockchain is a technology that, I mean, it's not obvious how to uh, use blockchain when it comes to personal data. What we have decided to do as a first step is to remove personal data from the blockchain, to have the, the personal data only on the digital wallets. So there is no personal data whatsoever on the blockchain. We had to learn that. So we went to, <laughs> we tried to put the deed document of the holder. So when you actually share the information, if you are into this, you know that your wallet will sign that um, presentation, what we call the verifiable presentation. And we tried to see if we could eventually put the deed document of the citizen on chain. But that is actually a deed, this uh, random string of you know, numbers and letters is also considered personal data. So we had to uh, go back and say, okay, the wallet will share it and there will be no personal data whatsoever on chain. What we will have is only information about the issuers. And this is why we only use blockchain for the verification of issuers, not for the ver verification of the existence of that wallet um, and the retrieval of the associated public keys. That is done by the wallet directly. So just to say that personal data and blockchain is not obvious, requires uh, thinking, is not, let's say, a full blocker. There are ways to go around it. So there could be regulations that allow for certain cases to personal for personal data to be there. Um, but definitely in Europe, when I compare to, I was just in an in a exchange of views with Asia, where there is no such kind of uh, concern. Um, of course, there are, let's say, different ways of doing this where we are, uh, whereas in the rest of the world could be completely different. So just to, I think that's, that's super helpful, but just to crystallize exactly what the issue was, it sounds like what you're saying is that it's specifically the combination of the immutability of the ledger, which means that it cannot be changed and it will forever be there, and the personal information. We have other systems where we store personal information, but the reason that there is risk here is because... Oh, is that not only, because uh, our blockchain is public blockchain. So it means that um, all the information that is on, on chain, we expose APIs that, of course, because we want the verifier to be anywhere and anyone. So it means that the information that is there is public. It's permissioned, so it means that you cannot really write on the blockchain. You have to have a certain permission to do it, but the information once is there, it's public. And that is also one of the additional reasons why um, personal data becomes uh, sort of problematic because have you given, let's say, consent for the retrieval of your deed by anyone or not, you know? So it's solvable, but as a first step, 
to avoid any you know, concerns around that. There are other ways, and the other ways is just to trust the digital wallets. Understood. Could we maybe double click a little bit on those risks? What are the sorts of circumstances where you think a blockchain-based uh, approach probably wouldn't be suitable? It sounds like cases where immutability and the public nature of a private informa personal information come together. Are there any sorts of other heuristics you'd recommend that we think about when sort of assessing a situation as a blockchain use case? Yeah, I mean, we are sometimes confronted with people that try to shoehorn blockchain into the use case. And what we say is like, don't create complexity just because you want to say that you are innovative and you use blockchain. Um, let's look at the case of diploma. Why is it interesting to have blockchain? Because the verifier can be anywhere. The verifier has, of course, to be anyone. I mean, you can be a small company, you verify the diploma, you're just an employer, right? When it comes sometimes to closed groups that anyway have to trust each other and you try to disintermediate, you know, uh, ingrained, entities that everyone has any way to trust, it's not making much sense, right? So don't use blockchain for cases where anywhere, anywhere you have an entity that you need to trust and you're just creating complexity. Understood. What's on the horizon? You mentioned a number of use cases already, but I think there's probably much more in the works. Yes, indeed. I think that uh, once we have this uh, critical mass of um, use cases and we have the verification process uh, understood and the value understood because many, f let's say, people, including myself, before starting working on this, don't see verification really as a problem. Uh, we will have uh, a number of other use cases like track and trace, uh, blockchain timestamping. Um, we are thinking an about a number of other things because once the blockchain is there, the EBSI, the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, manned by the member states, is deployed, fully operational, which is becoming now just um, a few more steps and we are fully operational. It means that there will be a number of other ways to use it for the benefit of citizens and businesses. And hopefully you can have a look online and, and learn with our experience. Perfect, very exciting. Looking forward to being a reality. I see Circa in the wings. It might be time to... Yes, I'm afraid so. Thank you so much. I'm sure we could all listen to it for a long, long time, but we do have a, a hard stop. So thank you both so much. We give everyone a big round for our last speech on the Shotlight stage. <laughs>